everybody. It's great to be here. My name is Alexis Paramal, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, my journey in data science, genomics, and uh, cloud computing. So for today's talk, uh, I wanted to share my own journey across uh, computing, genomics, and data. Uh, excited to share that, and I'm hoping that it's helpful to uh, people here as you each uh, consider your own journey and what you would like that to look like. I want to highlight some themes that I think can help us, observations that I've, I've made along the way. Uh, and I'm actually interested in having a discussion, so I'm hoping that we have plenty of time at the end uh, to have a lively discussion, uh, talk through these themes and get your perspectives on it. Also, we live in this COVID world, and so uh, unlike the last time I gave this presentation, uh, COVID looms large, and I thought it would be great to incorporate that in the discussion. And not just in terms of what the world looks like today, but what it can look like in a post-COVID world, because I really don't think uh, post-COVID will be the same as what pre-COVID is like. And likely, I want to encourage everybody on, on your own path of exploration. I'll also have some book recommendations at the end. So a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Alexis Paramal. I have a wonderful family that you can see here in my picture. This picture was actually from our vacation in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Uh, I had the, um, I've had the privilege to go to um, great schools, uh, UC Irvine, uh, as well as Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, and also to uh, work at three great companies, HP, Illumina, and Grail. And I'll be talking about that further. Also, uh, of course, there's life outside of work and outside of our profession. I love fitness and exercise. I have a picture of my bike here. I uh, love playing sports, and uh, hopefully we get a chance to talk a little bit about fitness and health and data as well. A little bit about my family. Uh, my wife, Monica, in the picture there, uh, teaches sixth grade math at Cambridge School in, in San Diego. Uh, my youngest son, who is right uh, just over my shoulder here on the left, is now uh, in his freshman year at Calvin University in Grand, Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, and they are actually in person. My daughter Zara, there in the back, um, actually studied um, computer science and machine learning. She's working at Google and uh, in, in, uh, in Boston. And then my oldest son, Daniel, who's next to me here in the front of the picture, uh, works at Gartner Digital Markets in Austin, Texas. That's a little bit about me. Uh, I will be going into more detail on that, but uh, I'd like to hear more uh, about you. So I think we we're going to do a poll. Roberto, do we have a poll set up? Yes, we do. And we are waiting in for the data. It's set up and we're ready to go. Awesome. So um, attendees, if you look on right over the chat, you can see a little button called polls. In there, uh, you can fill out all the information um, that you can see in the slides. So um, feel free to answer your profession. Um, well, in this case, what is your current primary profession? You have out of these, fifth, out of these ten different answers. Let's see what everyone else is up to. And I can clarify too a few points. Uh, I said software developer engineer. You, maybe you're not a software or computer engineer, but maybe you're mechanical engineer or double E or civil engineer, that will be engineering. Uh, scientist number four is obviously different from data scientist, so we're breaking out data science separately. So, you know, a physicist or a chemist or what have you. Business is a very broad category. Um, you know, I, I just uh, made up these categories. Pick the one that, in your opinion, best fits you. Uh, and if none of them fit, feel free to, to pick other. And also, um, don't hesitate if you're in the second to last category where you're just enjoying life. That's awesome. I applaud that and don't hesitate to pick that category. That's great. That's great. And I'm pretty sure we're going to find people in all categories. We are now seeing that there are a lot of people answering. So keep on answering. Keep on jumping into that poll. Let's just see how distributed it and how split up we are. And Okay, so it turns out um, we have about 22% of our audience are full-time students. We have 13% who are downright data scientists, 14% who are software developers or engineers, 7% yeah, who are data scientists, who are just scientists, 12% of, of, of the people who took the polls are, are, business, are in business, 6% um, are advanced professionals with uh, graduate degrees, 
seems like we have 0% in both skilled trade and in service industries. Um, we have 3% who are not working or studying, so they're enjoying life, as you uh, put it. And 23% are in other. Wow, oh, great. Fascinating results. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I got to tip my hat to the people that are in the not working or studying but are here in a data science conference. You've got to really appreciate that. And I'm curious to hear more about the other, although that may be mechanics of that um, in, in right now may be hard. But, um, you know, so this is interesting, right? So here we are meeting to talk about data science and we have this broad diversity and, and just seeing the previous speaker who has a lot of deep expertise in data science and data preparation. Um, that's not me. I'm not... I'm not a, a multi-decade data scientist, um, but, I, but I do, um, you know, it's like a friend of mine said, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I can play one on TV. I, I, I do like to dabble in data science. I have been learning data science, and I'll be talking more about that. And this is a theme that we're going to come back to, that data science doesn't have to be just something that is your formal profession for you to enjoy it and to get to uh, partake in it and to, uh, to get benefit from it as well. So we'll be talking about that more. We have another poll here, and this is going deeper on the data science side. And so uh, this is getting at where are you in terms of, you know, are you just thinking about data science? Maybe you haven't made a decision, but you thought you would come to this event, learn a little more about it, and decide if this is something you want to learn about. Are you currently primarily in a learning mode? And hopefully everybody here is in a learning mode, but, but is, is this like the key descriptor for you? Um, do you use data science? Meaning meaning you don't think of yourself as a data scientist, but you actively use data science in what you do during your day. Um, the, the next category, four, would be you actually are a data scientist in terms of your, your, your title, your profession, but you're new at it. And I just arbitrarily set the threshold of two years, or you're beyond new, you've been doing that for a while, or other. All right, so attendees, remember, if right on top of the chat area, you have a little tab called polls. In there, you can start answering and just start filling out in whichever category, in this case, your data science experience. What is your opinion, Alexis? How do you think this one's going to spread out? I suspect that the first category, a lot of people are thinking about it, but they've already moved into the learning stage, so my own... Prediction is that that first category will actually be relatively low. Learning data science, I think, would be relatively high. Using data science, I think, will also be high. And then we had, I think, for the, what, four and five, we already had some indication. 13% on the previous one said they were data scientists. So presumably those two would add up to approximately 13%. Of course, the last poll was skewed heavily because we had 23% in the other category. So hopefully I did a better job on this question of anticipating answers other is really a way of capturing if I kind of... And it actually turns out you're, you're somewhat spot on. I mean, um, when asked, what is your data science experience? 5% um, ticked off thinking about data science. 43% ticked off learning data science. 23% of, of the people who took the poll answered using data science. 16% consider themselves due data scientists or engineers or analysts with under two years of experience. 11% consider themselves experienced data scientists or engineers or analysts. And only 2% uh, mentioned the, the option other. Excellent. Excellent. Really interesting. Really interesting. So this is an exciting group. I had, I, I've had the privilege of attending two of the in-person data science field conferences, and I appreciate the chance to meet people and have drinks on the patio. And, you know, in this COVID world, we're not able to do that. Uh, but, but certainly a uh, broad diversity of people and would, would be great. And, and we look forward to the day when we are again able to meet in person and, um, and, and meet each other that way. I will keep going here. Okay, so one more question about COVID. And we're going to talk about COVID later in the presentation. Really simple. Impact of COVID on your quality of life, both COVID itself and the lockdowns. Has it made your life worse? Has it made it better? Is it mixed? A little bit better, a little bit worse. And overall, it's hard to say. Um, are you undecided or unknown or are you other? 
Well, I have to say that is quite an interesting question. I think here everyone's going to have their own uh, their own take on just how strange this whole situation has been. Um, once again, um, to everyone answer, answering the polls, remember that little tab on top of the chat, um, right next to where it says chat, you can start answering the polls. Um, here, I don't know, I'm tossed. I think people are going to start giving up more mixed answer. What do you think? Well, clearly for many people it's worse, and so I expect we'll have a pretty good share of worse. And certainly even if a given individual is not directly impacted by COVID, meaning you did not get COVID, many of us have extended family, friends, relatives, people we know that have been impacted um, very seriously medically. So I, I would expect many people are in the worst category. Um, and certainly from a lockdown standpoint, there are a lot of things we like to do that we're not able to do, such as travel, sports, go to the gym, um, go to work in many cases. For many people, it's not just you can work at home, you can't work. So a lot of people I think will be worse. Some people will be better. I don't think that will be a large number, but I think it will be non-zero. And even for myself, in some ways, my quality of life in some ways has improved. Um, and certainly avoid a commute. If you're in the Bay Area, you don't have to sit on 101. That's a big improvement. I think mix will be the biggest one for that reason, right? When you combine those two things, I think mix will be the biggest category. Undecided or unknown, I think we'll get some, and then we'll see on other. You no, know, again, maybe there's some other way of looking at it. Well, once again, I have to admit, admit you were spot on. Um, when asked how are, how how are you after the impact of COVID and COVID lockdowns, 15% mentioned worse. 21% mentioned better. A staggering 59% said mixed, whereas 3% said undecided or unknown, and only 2% ticked off other. Excellent. And again, we're going to come back to COVID later in the presentation, but a lot of interesting uh, discussion points here. All right, I'm going to keep going here. So I want to talk about my data journey. So if I go back to when I was in high school, and think about the things I studied and the things that I did. I had a broad array of interests. And I was really, at, as I was approaching the end of high school, and this was, to date myself a little bit, this was in the mid-80s, I was trying to decide what should I study. And I distinctly have a very vivid picture of sitting at an electric typewriter, filling out my application for the University of California, and I got to the line where it said major, and I was struggling with what to put for my major. And I actually had an interest in three different majors that were listed. Uh, one was economics, another one was political science, and a third one was computer science or information and computer science. I wasn't sure which to pick. I ended up picking the third one. And the reason I picked the third one, two reasons. One was I was convinced, and this, was, uh, this would have been like 1984, I was convinced that computing would radically change the world and change society, and I wanted to be a part of that. And number two, a practical reason, I thought at that time, it was very hard to get into it. And I thought if I get into that program and if I decide to do something else later, it would be easy to switch out of it. But I might not be able to get into it later. So that's what I picked. And I ended up going to UC Irvine in Southern California and studying computer science. And it was amazing. It was an amazing program for me. Just a couple observations about college and then I'm going to move on beyond college. But one observation is... As I look at the program that I did in computer science at Irvine, uh, which, by the way, at least at that time, was the oldest and the largest computer science program within the University of California system, um, a lot of what we have today, uh, what is it, 30 years later, a lot of what we have today in computing that we think about actually existed at that time in a more nascent form. Uh, you know, obviously at that time we didn't have the World Wide Web the way we think about it. We didn't have AI and machine learning the way we think about it. We didn't have iPhones. Uh, but there was artificial intelligence. There was the Internet. Uh, we studied a lot of these things. I think the biggest thing that has changed in that period of time is actually the amount of compute power that we have at our fingertips and the interconnectedness of everything and the extent to which everything has been digitized. And we're going to come back to that. Um, so 
Love the program. And also the other thing that was interesting to me was just learning how to write code. It also, I felt like I was learning how to think in a clear and structured way. So even separate from anything I could put into a computer, uh, I felt like it helped to, to tighten the way I, I, I could actually think and approach problems. And I really appreciated that. So I finished uh, at UC Irvine and, and um, I, had, I had, had a chance to do a couple internships and I had the privilege of being able to join HP. And uh, so I moved to San Diego and started working at HP. And this was in the printing organization, the early days of inkjet printing. Uh, and it was really exciting for me because um, the San Diego location of, of HP was really focused on color printing, which today I don't think we think of give color a second thought in terms of printing or hard copy or our photos or anything else. Right? Of course, it's all in color. Of course it is. Um, but in those days, color wasn't as normal, and uh, there was a lot of uh, black and white. And so we were on the vanguard of what we call digital imaging, bringing color. We talked about color to the office. That later extended to digital photography. I got a chance to do very exciting work with uh, scientists at HP Labs as we were working on processing uh, digital data, images, photographs, figuring out how not only to print it, but then developing things like uh, color copier, color all-in-one. Uh, these are things that nowadays uh, a large, large number of people don't even print anymore, right? So these are things that we don't think about very much. But at that time, it was revolutionary. And the transition in photography from film to digital photography was, was very profound and got a chance to be a part of that. Uh, of course, in technology, there are trends, right? Things go up and they come back down. And uh, HP uh, grew phenomenally, um, but then it, it hit... It hit a rough spot as it moved into the 21st century. And I was shocked one day to log into my email at work and see an email message from Meg Whitman offering me if I wanted to take an early retirement. And I had no concept of retirement. At that time, I had three kids, two of them approaching college age. And um, retirement was certainly not something I thought about and certainly not a possibility. But I thought, you know, if, uh, if I can find something interesting, if I can find another good opportunity, uh, maybe I should do that. So I, uh, I decided I'm going to look, and depending on what I find, uh, if I find something good, then I would go ahead and accept the offer of early retirement. And if I didn't, then I would just stay at HP. So I live in San Diego, and within San Diego, there are some of the major industries uh, in the area. Of course, travel and tourism is a big industry in San Diego. Within technology, uh, defense and the defense industry is, is really big in San Diego. But that wasn't really my background. I didn't have a security clearance. I didn't have prior military experience. So I thought, well, that, you know, although interesting technically, that may not be the way I want to go. Another area that's really big in San Diego is cellular technology. Qualcomm, especially at that time, was really uh, taking off with uh, digital cellular technology. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a, a, a possible area to go into. But again, not one that I had particular background in. And then another big industry within San Diego is biotech. Again, an area I didn't know very much about. Went online and found that uh, Illumina at that time had a lot of um, openings posted and uh, saw some positions in software program management that looked appealing to me. I had, at HP, I had worked as a developer for five years and then moved into managing development teams. And so uh, looking at Illumina, uh, I thought, okay, this is an opportunity for me to bring large-scale software development experience to Illumina as it's ramping up and decided to go ahead and uh, make that transition. So uh, um, I'm going to talk later in my presentation about genomics, so I'm not going to go into a lot of that now, but suffice to say that going to Illumina was just absolutely amazing for me to learn about biology at the cellular level, to learn about DNA and the impact that DNA has on, on our lives and the impact that modern technology, science, computing, and data processing has in our ability to understand DNA and understand ourselves. And so I'm going to talk about that more uh, in, in a few minutes. But continuing in terms of my data journey, I was, at, um, I was at Illumina, started in 2012. And in uh, 2013, Illumina decided to acquire a company named uh, called uh, NextBio in Santa Clara in the Bay Area. And... Um, in, at the beginning of 2014, a new business unit was formed within Illumina that included NextBio and included some of the people in San Diego as well. And I was part of that group. And so I started spending a lot of time 
with the group in Santa Clara that was doing amazing work um, developing uh, what we call a phenotype genotype database technology. So that is large databases and curating large data stores that capture information on both the what's called the molecular data, which is the DNA data for a cohort of patients or study participants, and also the clinical data, so how they present in terms of disease conditions, and then looking for correlations between those. So I started spending a lot of time in the Bay Area, and, uh, and then at that time I was also thinking about going back to school, and so I decided to uh, actually do the MBA program uh, at, uh, at Wharton, uh, the San Francisco campus, and doing that while I was working. So that actually w worked out really well. And I actually will not be talking too much about the Wharton program, but I would definitely strongly recommend it to anybody that, that's considering it. Um, and I could, talk, I could talk the whole time about Wharton, but I won't. But I will give one story. Uh, second term, we had a macroeconomics class taught by Professor Andy Abel, and an amazing professor. He actually co-wrote the textbook for the class. The co-author was Ben Bernanke. And he, uh, he and Ben had been... Um, I think they were roommates or friends back at Princeton, wrote the book together. One of the exercises in the class was to do a simulation, and I love games and simulations, so my eyes kind of perked up when I heard we were going to be doing this simulation. It was a simulation of a national economy, and we were supposed to put in parameters for monetary policy and fiscal policy, and we would break up into groups, and then the team that had the best, the strongest economy at the end of multiple rounds would be the winner. And so I thought, this sounds like fun. This sounds like a chance to uh, play a game and my competitive instincts got going. So I, I decided to put together what I considered my dream team of, of um, classmates. And so I recruited this amazing team of, of people that included uh, one guy who was like one of the chief engineers at Uber, another guy who was a VP at Goldman Sachs, another guy who was like head of engineering at a firm, a lot of really high powered, high powered, uh, high powered guys. And, um, we got together um, for our first meeting, and I thought, you know what? I think I have this figured out. I had got the professor's paper. I figured out where he published the equations for how all these things are optimized. I put it into an Excel spreadsheet, um, tuned it all, set it all up, uh, set it up with Solver, and I thought, okay, here we can get, we can do an optimization every round using my little spreadsheet, and uh, and we can win this thing. I go to my first meeting with, with the other students and I tell them, hey guys, I got it all figured out. I have my magic spreadsheet, this will solve it. And uh, one of the guys turns to me and goes, oh, that's funny, I implemented it in Java. And then another guy turns and says, oh, I did it in C++. And then, uh, and then another one says, oh, I did it in Java. So then I thought, okay, well, we have three coded implementations and I have my little spreadsheet and then I kind of sheepishly put my spreadsheet away and just kind of watched as we did the rest of the exercise. Coming out of that exercise, it caused me to think, you know, I used to write code back in the day. I used to write C code and then C++ as we we're doing image processing. Um, and it's been, it had been at that point, it had been maybe 10, 15 years since I had written code. I thought I should start writing code again. At the time, my daughter was in college. She was actually at MIT, at MIT studying uh, computer science, and, and I remember talking to her, and she said, Dad, you really ought to consider learning Python. And uh, so we had that conversation, and at that time, my youngest son was in middle school, so I thought, you know what, that's a good idea. Why don't I learn Python, and, uh, and I can do it with him and with his friends. And so uh, we got a group together of my son and a number of his friends and a number of their dads. And we would get together on Saturdays. Um, and, and I'm actually going to now show a slide of this book. I guess it's not easy to do a show of hands, but I'm, I, um, but I'm just curious to know how many people have seen or heard of this book. Is there an easy way to, Roberto, to find out the response of, if that's not easy, we don't need to do it. But I'm just curious how many have heard of this book. Um, what we can do is that the attendees you can send you can send to the chat um, if you've seen or if you've read this book feel free to, to just answer to just say yes I've read it yes I've seen it and we can monitor it from there so you can kind of give a ballpark figure of at least a bird's eye view of how many how many receivers there have been are you seeing responses in chat so 
for the time being, we have, yeah, I do. Yeah, I've heard of it. I've seen that book. Super keen to read this one. I've heard it, heard of it. Uh, yeah, a lot of people are just saying uh, that they want to read it. Uh, I've seen it. A couple of people saying that uh, they haven't seen it, that uh, they think the book is okay. Uh, they, they have it, but they haven't read it. Okay, maybe now's a good time. Um, yeah, we have a lot of people. A lot of people coming in. Read parts of the book as well. Right. Well, so this was this was a book I found, and this picture is second edition. When we did it, it was not the second edition; it was the first edition. Um, but this this is a really cool book. I really like this book, and I really recommend it for anybody that's interested in learning Python. And particularly if you're somebody who um, is maybe doesn't have a computer science background or a coding background, um, it's written from the standpoint of people who are office workers, and you just want to like automate stuff you do in the office. Um, and in retrospect, it maybe wasn't the optimal fit for kids because kids don't care about PDF files and Excel files and data sets. Kids are not thinking of that. We'll get to that. But, but for grown-ups that are working in an office, if you're doing work that you feel is uh, a bit monotonous, this, this is a, a good book. And what's cool about this book, there are a number of cool things about it. One is that if you go to this link, uh, he actually published the entire book online. So you don't actually have to buy it. You can actually read it online in, in, the, in a web browser uh, and, and get the benefit of it. Um, of course, you can buy the book. For, you can buy it from No Search Press or from Amazon or wherever. Uh, and uh, there are also videos uh, that, are, um, that he's posted in YouTube. And again, you get links to that at the, at the site. Uh, a number of the videos you can watch uh, for free. And then uh, I think they ask you to... Uh, sign up i think i think it's in udemy um to uh if you want to watch the full set of videos and the videos the author basically walks through the book um the videos are basically the same content as the book um so you don't have to i mean you could learn it yourself just with the book but um the videos walk you through it and it worked really well when we were with the uh with these middle schoolers and by going through this book and the chapters in this book we learned basic python and programming and got a chance to uh, play around with it now, one of the things, and then I, we also did some other stuff that were beyond the scope of the book. Uh, one of the things we did was um, turtle graphics. And this is very simple. So for those that don't know programming, there's the, this idea here of a, of a function in Python. And in this case, this is a function to draw a square. And it's very simple. You just move, you move the turtle and you tell it where to go. And it goes there, and it's dragging its tail, so it draws a square. And I actually, going back, back the, over the decades, back to the late 80s at UCI, learning computer science, my first course in using UCSD P system Pascal, we actually did turtle graphics in that program. So this, this reminded me of those old days. This is, of course, in Python, not in Pascal. But it's the same basic idea, and this is useful because it can teach you how to encapsulate certain functions into uh, how to group them together, how to package them together into a function. And then here you draw a square. So I remember actually, actually when I was a student, it wasn't a square, it was a triangle. We drew a triangle. And I remember looking at the screen thinking, I just drew this triangle. Companies are going to pay us a lot of money to draw a triangle. I, I don't know if that's going to work. Um, but what, what we found was by extending, by ex extending this, uh, we can... Um, you draw another square and then a rectangle and you put a triangle on top and you can make that a house. And then you can call the draw house function. This is very simple. Kids can do this. Kids can actually do this in, you know, like in, in, uh, in maybe an hour or two, um, you know, kids can figure this out and they can write the code to do this. Now, it takes you an hour or two to draw a house, whereas if you had your pen, you could draw it in just a minute or so. So what's the, what's the value? Well, the value of drawing the house in a function instead of with your actual physical pen is that you can put it, in this case, into a loop. And then the loop allows you to make 10 houses or 100 or 100,000 or a million houses, right? And so that's, I think, really where the value of computing and of scale. Of course, you can add a little color to it and uh, have fun with it, right? So now we're able to draw houses and make houses at volume. We put energy, and it's actually a lot more work to draw one house, but now we can make a whole bunch because we made that investment. This then led to another book that we did with the kiddos, which I enjoyed too, which was Learn to Program with Minecraft. And this was actually better for the kids because the kids love Minecraft. 
they don't really care, like I said, about PDFs and Excel and those kinds of things. But all kids everywhere seem to love Minecraft. I didn't know anything about it, so my son had to show me how to play Minecraft. But what's cool about this book, also from uh, No Search Press, is that in Minecraft, there's a special server, and they tell you how to set it up, where instead of just building your, work, your world by clicking and building all this stuff in Minecraft, you can actually have a, an interface with Python where you can go to any coordinate in the Minecraft world, and you can read the block type, or you can write the block type. So by writing the block type, you can uh, create things in code. And we ended up, and there are a lot of exercises in the book. The book is actually, in our, I would say that the, the second book, the Minecraft book, is actually easier than the first book. And so by this point, the kids knew Python you know, pretty well. So we actually skipped a number of things that were in that book. Um, because they were somewhat easy, right, for the kids. But but this basic idea of having the infrastructure where you could build in Minecraft through code enabled us to do the same thing in three dimensions. So instead of drawing a square, we could make a slab of, of square blocks. Uh, I could make a three-dimensional cube or a rectangle. Instead of a triangle, I could put a pyramid on top. And I could make a building. And so this is, this is not all the code, but this is most of it. And I, I'm not going to go through the code, but suffice to say, it's pretty simple. Um, and it's the same basic principle that you saw with Turtle, where you're just doing it in three dimensions, and you're doing it through this, um, through, through this package in Python that allows you to interact with Minecraft. And the result, with about 100 lines of code, is a city of buildings. So... This, as you can imagine, had a powerful impact. And this leads to what I would call the first theme, which is I consider computing as a superpower, computing and coding, right? So computing and its derivatives is a superpower that can become ours. And I list some of the derivatives here, coding, the internet, for example, data science, internet of things, you know, what, there are a lot of things you can list here that branch out from this. But the point is we live in a time and in a place where these superpowers are accessible for those that are willing to invest a little time and energy to get over a learning curve. And I would also argue that the learning curve is, you know, through things like Udemy and, and Data Science Go and, you know, girls' classes, all these things, um, those barriers, those learning curves are much lower than they've ever been. And these are true superpowers uh you know my son likes to read these books where you know they um you know they they you know you have these super magical powers and you can maybe become invisible or fly or things like that and i would argue this is this fits that description right what you can do in code compared to what what you can't do if you don't have those abilities is is truly uh, amazing both at the individual level and also at the greater, you know, at the greater level of all of humanity, and also obviously superpowers. You know, another superpower we can think of would be even, you know, um, uh, atomic energy and nuclear energy, right? I mean, and that could be a good thing or it can be a bad thing, and it could be extremely good or extremely evil. And so, it's important. Um, but the genie's out of the bottle, right? So it's important that those that that want to do the right thing are um, taking advantage of this superpower. There's another theme that I, I'm seeing here, and, and we'll touch on this more, um, but to think of blank more as a skill than a role. So there are people here, and I really respect them, right, who identify themselves as professional data scientists, as an example. Um, I don't think of myself as a professional data scientist in that that is my primary role, but data science is something that I like to use. It's a skill that I have that I'm developing. Many people here have developed their data science skills much further than me, um, but that's okay. It's just like if, you know, like last, last uh, what, a week ago I was on the Embarcadero and you go running on the Embarcadero in San Francisco, and there are people that are running, walking on a bike, listening to music. It doesn't matter if somebody's running faster than me. It doesn't matter if somebody's running slower than me. What matters is that we're all just out there, we're doing our thing, and we're enjoying it, right? So. Um, I, I don't think we need to think of it so much as a competition as much as what, what can we do. And so think of coding more as a skill than a role. I really encourage everybody to learn coding. And, you know, I described my example with Python. 
um, because I think I think you will find it useful. I think you will find it helpful. That doesn't mean you need to be a coder. It doesn't mean that that needs to be your job the way you're a programmer or software engineer. Um, but I think you can benefit from it. Program management, and I haven't talked much about it, but I spent a lot of my career working in program management. There are very large, complex projects that have professional program management. I have my own PMI, PMP certification. But increasingly, what I'm seeing is that there is a need for program management all around us. And, and the um, formal, official, full-time program managers uh, focused on a particular project is actually more the exception than the rule. Uh, and that's for the largest, most complex projects. But generally, there are projects of all kinds of sizes and all kinds of scales that need good program management. So I encourage people also, likewise, if I'm talking to a program management group, to think of that. Uh, I've already talked about data science, and there could be a lot of other areas. So really to think of these as superpowers that are in your bags of, bag of tricks that you can use. So let's see. Um, let me just check my notes to see what else. So um, let me talk a little bit. I think I'm going to shift to... Um, let me shift to genomics. And I, I promise you I would talk about this. And genomics is an amazing world. And it's a world that I, again, first started learning about in 2012 uh, when I was talking to my friend who had started at Illumina. So um, there are a couple of key places. I mean, you can go to Gregory Mendel and the work that he did with peas and, and learning about inherited traits. You can look at the... Um, the double helix, the work of Watson and Crick in the 50s to discover that the DNA molecule in our body is where we have the encoding that programs how our body is, is made. Uh, you can look at the Human Genome Project, which, um, which uh, was an amazing project. The Human Genome Project took about a decade to sequence, quote, they called it at that time the human genome. I like to call it a human genome because we all have a different genome. It's very similar. Uh, Roberto, your genome and my genome are very similar, um, but they're not identical. And the differences are significant. The differences uh, affect our propensity for disease. The differences affect how we metabolize drugs. Um, there are now, I think it's on the order of 25% of controlled substances now have dosage guidelines that are actually, um, that are, that are actually modified based on your genome and your, your genome expression. And so if you Look at a bottle of Tylenol, you know, it says if you're below 12, take this much. If you're over 12, take that much. But we know that those are very coarse guidelines and for very important drugs that it's not, it's, it's not the right, right uh, way to set a dosage, that you really want to understand how a particular individual metabolizes genomes or metabolizes um, a therapeutic substance. So if you look at this diagram... This is a very powerful diagram, and I want to describe it. So the first thing to realize is, so this is, you know, time on the x-axis. Um, this is the cost of sequencing a genome from 2001. So the Human Genome Project was about 2 to $3 billion to get one genome. That was in the 90s. Uh, Illumina was created around 1998, 1999. So Illumina actually was after the Human Genome Project, and Illumina got involved in DNA sequencing. Uh, you see that this is actually a logarithmic scale. So if you look at Moore's law that I think most people are familiar with, which says that the power of computing doubles every, every 18 months, um, Moore's law is on a logarithmic scale as a straight line. And then what you see here is what's, what's often been called Flatley's law, which is the cost of DNA sequencing of a genome, an entire genome, and how that cost has been dropping much more aggressively than Moore's law. And this difference is very profound because, again, we're on a logarithmic scale. So this means dramatic reduction. So at the time this slide was made, and you can see 2018, uh, cost of sequencing a genome was about $1,000, and it has, come, it has come lower than that since. Uh, and it will continue to, continue to go lower. And, that's, and this is really uh, where Illumina has been driving, um, driving the market in terms of dramatic reductions, orders of magnitude reductions in the cost of sequencing. And so um, this is profound. What this means is that the ability to sequence people at scale, meaning large numbers of people, 
is now coming into play. So when I was at Illumina, um, soon after I joined, um, a big project that came to the surface was a 100,000 genomes project in the UK. And the idea was to sequence 100,000 people. So going from one genome in the 90s with the Human Genome Project to 100,000 people. And, uh, th and this, this was an amazing project that Illumina got involved in. Jay Flatley, who was the CEO of Illumina at the time, actually signed the agreements for Illumina's participation at 10 Downing Street. And this was a breakthrough in terms of the UK. This was uh, David Cameron, the um, Prime Minister of the UK at the time. This was, this, this was one of his signature projects. And it was about revolutionizing um, healthcare and the way the National Health Service provides healthcare in England and in the UK. And so um, that project has since completed. It was several years. We built uh, what we call genome factories to actually process these samples at scale. And you can imagine the amount of data that was generated from that. In terms of applications of it, there are really two ways to think about it. One is individual patient care. Um, and two is amassing this large data set that uh, potentially influences scientists and clinicians, epidemiologists, in terms of how we treat disease long-term going forward. So there are two parts of that. Within patient care, uh, there are two specific conditions that we focus on. One is on cancer, and the other is on rare disease. That's within, uh, within this 100,000 Genomes Project. Within cancer, and I'm realizing that time is escaping me here, so I'll try to say this quickly, but within cancer, um, you know, a lot of times, I think a lot of people maybe don't realize what cancer is, but fundamentally, cancer is, is a direct result of mutations in the DNA. And if you flip, and if I had the time, I would make this a poll, but I'm not going to make it a poll. But if but my, the rhetorical question I would ask is, if I flip a bit on your computer hard drive, maybe I'll ask Roberto. Roberto, can I ask you the question? Sure, by all means, I'm okay. here. So Roberto, let me ask you, if I flip a bit on your hard drive, I go into your computer and I find one bit and I flip it from zero to one or one to zero, what do you think happens to your computer? Um, I think it would just go haywire. Well, it could. Um, but for most people, like maybe half of your hard drive is empty. So if I flip a bit in the empty part of your hard drive, you may be okay. Okay. And if, but let's say I hit something. Well, if I, if I hit uh, maybe a term paper you wrote when you were in school a long time ago that you never will look at again, and maybe I corrupt that file, that Microsoft Word file, maybe you don't care. Or maybe I hit one of your photos, um, but, and, uh, but maybe I hit a part of the metadata that keeps track of the uh, f-stop setting on your camera when you took that picture or the GPS coordinates, and again, you don't care. So I can flip a bit on your computer and chances are nothing will happen. You won't notice. I can flip another bit and you won't notice. I could flip a bit and I could actually do some damage, but it may be damage you don't care about because again, maybe you don't, you know, you have maybe 50,000 photos and if one of them is gone, you, you will never notice. And then I may hit an operating system file, but even there, I may hit an OS file that isn't used or is used very rarely and it doesn't matter. But then maybe your computer, I keep doing this every night, I keep flipping one bit on your computer, maybe it starts acting a little unstable. When do you get up and if you're running Windows, it would be a blue screen or a Mac, you get a kernel panic. And then it is a catastrophic failure and your computer doesn't work anymore. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. So imagine doing that to the human body. Imagine going into your DNA and flipping one location in the DNA. Now the body, when cells replicate, it is designed to check. There are multiple checks and corrections so that your DNA um, stays healthy and is correctly replicated. But there are also hundreds of trillions of cells in the body. So this becomes a math problem where DNA replication happens throughout your lifetime and it's being checked and corrected. But every once in a while, there's an error. But some of those are fine. But every once in a while, you get what I would call a catastrophic error. And a catastrophic error would be one that results in rapid cell growth. It affects the growth of the cell. And then there's also what's called cellular apoptosis, which is 
right? Because these cells are going to they die off quickly when you're okay. But if they don't die off, then now you have what's called a mutant colony, right? And and that mutant clone colony of cells will grow and get bigger and bigger out of control, right? And so in ancient times, they called this cancer for a cancer of the crab because they would look and they would see these masses and they would see these blood vessels to it and it looks like cancer of the crab, the cancer in the zodiac, it looks like a crab, all these blood vessels. It's also, you've heard of oncology. Onco comes from the word from bronco, meaning bull, a mass, it's a mass of tissue. So in a, in a case of cancer, you have a mutant clone colony. Your own cell, one cell mutated that has now multiplied. So if you want to understand cancer, a particular patient, you need to understand the mutations that led to that cancer. And that was a main part of, uh, of the uh, 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK, to understand that. And then you can use that to drive the treatment plan. It's actually much more important what the mutation is than where in the body the cancer is. And so um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not going to talk very much about Grail, but I'll just mention that, that Grail um, is in the business of developing a test to, from blood sample to sequence the DNA that has come from the cells in your body and with very sensitive detection to be able to determine and detect cancer at very early stages. And um, this is described, so Grail, Grail's S1 filing um, happened about two months ago. It's public, anybody can go to Grail and you can, or go to Google and you can look up Grail S1 filing. This is a new world we're moving into. And when I talk for power and a new world that we're moving into, um, this is the world we're moving into, and it's data-driven. And it's amazing to me to realize that our body is encoded in many ways, not identical, but, it, but in many ways similar to the way we think of encoding data in our software and in our programs and in the cloud. So let me, um, let me jump ahead. I'm going to show, these are some books. If you're interested in genomics and learning more about it, these are some books that impacted me and my journey. Um, the, the Cartoon Guide is an awesome book just to kind of get you started. James Watson, co-discoverer of the um, double helix and, and the DNA uh, structure as encoding genomic information. Um, if you want to understand that story, this is a great book. If you want to learn more about cancer, Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. Uh, Francis Collins actually led the Human Genome Project, and he's the head of the National Institute of, um, of, of Health. And working on was actually early stage work at the University of Pennsylvania detecting um, uh, CML chronic myeloid leukemia and how this was this form of leukemia was traced back to a uh, mutation in the chromosomes and how this eventually led to the development of a drug that was able to mask that that problem and, and functionally cure people. And this was a huge blockbuster drug that radically changed people's lives. And I don't have time to, to give that story, but, but if you're interested in how genomics and data um, can impact cancer care, uh, this is a good example. Um, this is a slide that shows some of the trends. This was actually a McKinsey report from, uh, from 2013 uh, and this was one that I came across relatively early in my career at Illumina, and it was very powerful to me because it shows disruptive technologies. Each of these technologies listed here is one that is expected to have a trillion dollar impact on the world by 2025. And if you look at, actually not each of them, I'm sorry, uh, one through seven are trillion dollar impacts if you look at this at this scale, but these are all very big changes. And if you look at these three that I highlighted, automation of knowledge work, which gets to things like, at, at a simple level, automate the boring stuff, the book I was talking about, but it really gets into artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud includes cloud computing and the internet and the power that we have and things like AWS, next generation genomics, which I just talked about, next generation sequencing. Uh, when you put these three together, I got the opportunity of those three. And we have, uh, at, when I was at Illumina, um, a, uh, an ecosystem in the cloud called Base Space that stores genomic data. Um, and 
the sequencers, and I already showed you the slide that shows how the amount of genomic data being sequenced is growing by orders of magnitude, right? This data is flowing into the cloud. When I started at Illumina, if somebody sent a genome to Illumina to be sequenced, Illumina would mail back a hard drive. Now it's all in the cloud and delivered that way. Uh, and, uh, and so there's an environment called Base Space, which is a repository for this genomic data. Base Space, to give you an idea, how are we doing? Running out of time, I'll go quick. But Base Space um, has on the order of 40 plus petabytes of data. So um, let's see. Well, let me ask you, Roberto. I mean, when, you, when I say petabyte, what does that mean to you? Do you know what a petabyte is? Um, vaguely familiar. Um, the size a lot, a lot, a lot larger than a terabyte. Yes. In order of magnitude. Yeah. So petabyte is ten to the fifth number of thousands, right? Or ten to the fifteen. So the way I would think of it is um, the um, if you think of a byte as a person, mm -hmm. you equate a byte with a person. Then one kilobyte, you know what a kilobyte is, a thousand bytes, thousand people, that's three, dump, three jumbo jets of people, approximately, right? Three jumbo jets would be a kilobyte. A megabyte is what? what how many people would a megabyte be? A megabyte is a thousand kilobytes. Yeah, so about a million, right? A thousand kilobytes or a thousand thousand, about a million. That's like the city of San Jose. A gigabyte is China. A terabyte is a hundred Earths. And a petabyte is a hundred thousand Earths. So within base space, we were seeing a new petabyte every month. And it's accelerating. So what's profound about this is the amount of data in the world is multiplying at a tremendous scale. And this creates opportunities. And so when you're talking about superpowers, right, this is a superpower you want to have. Remember all the houses we were building, right? You have that kind of multiplication. And in fact, the other thing I'll just mention very quickly, one of the things that's amazing about this slide is if you think of sequencing growing faster than Moore's Law, what that means is that improvements in the physical infrastructure are not sufficient to keep up with this. Eventually, this will swamp all the data centers in the world, you know, if, if, if this continues, right? So this means you need much better algorithms, much better approaches. If you look at, I'm going to jump ahead because I have more slides and time, but if you look at this automation of knowledge work, additional labor productivity could equal the output of 110 to 140 million full-time workers per year. 100 million people per year, right? This is what automation is doing. Um, I'm going to skip cloud. Genomics we already talked about. Um, but then overall putting it together, I think the point is the entire world around us is becoming digital. Atoms to bits. And this is a profound change in our, in our world, in our economy, in our society. And... Uh, if you think about even the S&P 500, the percentage of the S&P 500 market cap that's represented by technology stocks, it's much higher than it's ever been before. And, that's, and I think a lot of that is because as, as the analog world becomes digitized, and that includes DNA being sequenced, that includes me getting on a scale and that data going into the cloud and being stored in Apple Health, that includes me getting on a Peloton and my watch sending heartbeat data into the cloud, right? Um, that includes me clicking on something and that advertising data. That includes, as everything around us becomes digitized, then that means it's within the reach of algorithms and computing and cloud computing. And so I, I think you really want to be able to tap into that. So um, let me talk a little bit about COVID. I'm going to do this fast because we are over time and then we can leave a few minutes for questions. So COVID obviously impacted all of us in a very profound and tremendous way and wide in scale, wide in scale. Um, in many ways for me, I think COVID put data science on the map, literally in this case, in a way in the general society that, was, that had not been seen before. Now, of course, we have data all around us. It goes back, there's weather data, there's stock data, 
But when COVID started happening, people really cared. They had a personal interest in knowing what was happening. And all of a sudden, this dashboard from Johns Hopkins became a big deal. Um, for me, as I was looking at the Johns Hopkins data in real time, like in the March time frame, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with COVID, I wanted to see trending data. Now, they do have some trending data. They did it at that time. You see trending data down here. And it's actually disturbing. And we can talk about that if you look at this at where we are today. Um, but I want to see trending data at the local level. And what's cool about this, and what to me was really cool about this, is that if you look at this Johns Hopkins um, dashboard, if you look down here, it says GitHub. And you can actually click on GitHub on this. And this is just a picture, so I'm not going to click on it. But you can do it. You can go to the Johns Hopkins site. You can click on there, and you can get to the data source. And they publish the data source. And the data actually, there's actually more data in the data than there is on their dashboard. And I was able to find finer tuned data. Now, eventually, there were some issues with the local data. So I ended up getting more data from the New York Times. But I was able to put this into Tableau and just started building some charts. And uh, so this is my own experiment looking. And so you can see on the left, this is a cumulative number of cases through 22nd, so two days ago. And you can see that this is, there were over 40 million cases. You can see 1.1 million deaths. Um, you can see now on the right, left is cumulative, right is daily. How many new cases? Actually very disturbing, right? Um, that, uh, you know, we're seeing um, over 400,000 cases per day now of COVID. Now, the good news, if you want to think of it that way, is that deaths have not climbed with number of cases. So it's interesting to see how up until about mid-April, the number of deaths was growing number of daily deaths, but then it's actually come down a little bit, so even though the number of cases has gone up. I think part of that is because the uh, number of cases, a lot of young people now um, are, are being uh, noted in the case count. Um, right. So just some other slides I, I built here. If we look at COVID, um, red line is the US. So on the left is cumulative, on the right is daily. So you can see how the US um, has the most number of cases, over 8 million cases. You can see this is India, Warren, and then over very high counts. On a daily level, you can see India was rising very high and then peaked in September and it's coming down. And you can see the US was coming down, but it started going up. And now the US has moved ahead now with the most number of cases running at about 70,000 a day. Um, other trends by state, we can see how here US. New York State, we know, had a lot of cases in the April time frame. The time we got later in the year, it was dominated by California, Texas, and Florida, which are some of the largest states in the union. So to some extent, that may not be surprising. Those states have come down, but then other states have picked up, such that now we're seeing nationwide totals are back up. And this, this is, uh, in this case, New York Times data. And, and I, what I'm seeing here is a lot of like these northern states, like this is like Wisconsin or Indiana, uh, Midwestern states now, such that the total is moving up. I also plotted county data so that you can put any county and look at it. If you put my name and you go into Tableau uh, Public, you can probably find uh, these dashboards and you can put in your own country or city. But the point is that profound changes bring threats and opportunities. The post-COVID world will be very different from the pre-COVID world. I look at structurally at how we have learned that we can actually have knowledge workers work from home. Uh, we can actually do school. Now, school may be very messy, but the fact that it's even possible is amazing in this world. And I think a lot of things around commercial real estate, around travel, around business travel, uh, a lot of structural things are changing in the world. Um, uh, there will be a lot of suffering, and there is a lot of suffering, but there will also be opportunities. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think this gets to the previous themes we were talking about. So pulling it all together, computing and its derivatives is a superpower. Lifelong learning, think of whatever it is, more of a skill than a role. Atoms to bits, the entire world is becoming digital. And the post-COVID post world will be different. And I don't think we should be focused on what the COVID world is that we're in right now. What I'm talking about is once COVID is over, it has passed, just like the Spanish flu passed. And after about two years, 50 million people or 500 million people in a world of 1.5 billion 
contracted the Spanish flu, of which about 10% of those, so about 5 million people died. This will pass, but the world that we're in will be different. And, um, and then I just have some books here. I mentioned, um, you know, these books on genomics, Automate the Boring Stuff, Minecraft. These are two other books, Great Upheaval. This is a, one of my favorite books about history. Um, and it's interesting to see major trends in history and how, and how they affect that. And I think we're seeing that now with COVID. And Super Intelligence by Nick, Nick Bostrom is just a great book that I would recommend. So with that, I think we're about out of time. Uh, I don't know if we have time, Roberto, for questions or if, or if I used it all up. I apologize about that. Oh, no, don't sweat it. I think we have time for, unfortunately, only one question. Um, we have a question here coming up. Let me bring it up. From Semelid. Oh, it seems we have lost you. There you are. Welcome back. Um, Semelid asks, you shared a lot of amazing possibilities for the future of this field. What do you think is the main bottleneck that is holding back this field from its full potential? I think too often, it's my point about a skill versus a profession. Um, some people are going to do the heavy lift to make the pivot, to make data science a profession, and that's awesome. But I think this needs to be, you know, like a citizen democracy, right? I think everybody should be data literate. I encourage everybody to learn how to code. Everybody should get a working understanding of statistics, and we should apply it to our daily lives. And I think if you have hundreds of millions or billions of people doing that, then that will help humanity move in a much better direction. Awesome, awesome. Well, once again, thank you so much for that great presentation, Alexis. Uh... <laughs> I'm sure the audience was just as thrilled as you were. And well, once again, thank you so much for joining us.